And so I'd like us to pray and uh, then we can remind us a few things that the Lord is speaking to us. And so wherever you are, whichever position you can take, you can take so that we may pray together. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. We thank you for the good weather and uh, we thank you for the good gift of thy Holy Spirit. The one package which Jesus Christ solicited for us when he went back to heaven. And we are glad that we can partake of the fruits there in Lord. Help us to live a life that is worth our calling and to hasten the second coming of the son. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. And so uh, uh, speaking about uh, our work, uh, I'd like to look at uh, some quotations from the spirit of prophecy in what the Lord wants to remind us to do this year. And uh, as I'm presenting this, I'm just posing a challenge to everyone that is watching and listening and uh, challenging myself that this year, how will it be? And uh, as the records pass into eternity, what uh, shall be written upon our names? Our work. What is this work that uh, we have actually to do? In the book of Mark chapter eight, verses 36 and 37, we read that what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This is a, a very important question that uh, every one of us has to ask himself. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and then uh, lose his soul? Now, we are told that uh, everyone has a soul to win and a soul to lose. And uh, no one is going to go to heaven without having a crown. And to have a crown is to participate in the work that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has left for us. We look at the commission that uh, we are given and uh, uh, there's uh, a commission that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has uh, uh, given unto us. And uh, uh, this commission, uh, I hope that uh, we are acquainted uh, with it. And then we have the mission uh, that we are, we are told that we should have. Uh, first of all, he tells us that go ye into the world and make disciples, teaching them, baptizing them, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have told you. That is our work, our, com our commission is uh, uh, the gospel mission that is found in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 28. And uh, the mission is the three angels messages found in the book of, uh, uh, in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 14. That is uh, the work that uh, is of the most solemn import and uh, nothing sh should uh, preoccupy our minds than uh, actually uh, finishing the work. Where have we gone wrong then in the work as uh, finishers of the reformation? We who have been entrusted with the work, we ask ourselves, what is the problem? Uh, the time that we are living in, I can just say that uh, these three things are important to us. We are again in acceptable time and period. And Adventism was birthed out of reformation and reformation has to go forward. And also Adventism presented the best opportunity of finishing the great controversy. Uh, uh, let me just uh, in brief talk about these three points. Uh, we are again in acceptable uh, time uh, period. When uh, we are talking about uh, an acceptable period, uh, most of it, uh, people don't understand what it means to be in acceptable period, but being in acceptable period is um, being able to understand the time that you're living in and that which you're supposed to do. And uh, the disciples, when they were gathered with J Jesus Christ at uh, Mount Olivet, they were able to ask him, tell us what shall be the end of all these things and thy second coming. 
And then Christ was able to tell them the signs of the times that uh, will be a precursor or will be an eavesdrop to his second coming or the end of the end time events. And so when I talk about being in an acceptable time is that whatever you look and uh, whichever you hear, it really signifies the time periods that uh, were actually uh, prophesied by Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 24. And so we are in that time period, in acceptable time where actually our light has to shine. Uh, when uh, you read um, uh, the book of uh, Isaiah, and uh, I'll just turn to the book of Isaiah quickly when talking about um, acceptable times in the book of Isaiah chapter 60, the book of Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, this is what we read from uh, verse, uh, verse one, talking about uh, acceptable time. This is what the Lord, the word of the Lord says, arise, shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Now, how do we know that this is uh, the time to arise and this is the time that the glory of the Lord has to be seen around the four corners of the world? Verse two tells us what kind of times are those. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness, the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And verse three, uh, uh, then the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. So the acceptable time when the Lord wants to pour his glory upon his church, it is when the darkness fills the earth, when there's the gross darkness and misrepresentation and misapprehension of God's character, when the Bible religion is being cast out as something of all time. This is the time for the church to arise and it do it is duty because when the darkness is so gross and when the darkness is so immense, that is when if the light is uh, lit in any place, that is when it shines so bright. Uh, when everyone is professing religion, you cannot know who is in darkness. But when the darkness covers the earth and you see the deeds of men who hate the light, if you put the light on, it will shine more amidst that darkness. And so as uh, we see darkness and all the signs of the time happening, this is the acceptable time of the Lord to do the work so that the glory of the Lord may be able to shine. Can you speak to that person? So that the glory of the Lord may be able to shine and uh, our people may be able to be brought unto truth. And so this is the acceptable time. This is the time that uh, the Lord wants us to make our light shine so bright so that uh, the world may know that um, uh, the religion of the Bible, the gospel is a simplifier of all the world's problem. And it is the only power that can bring healing to the land. The, the, the next point, Adventism was about out of reformation. When talking about uh, Adventism was about out of reformation. Um, and uh, I'll be starting the series, uh, it has been delayed, the series of uh, uh, Revelation chapter 14, a 10 part series on Revelation chapter 14, why the three angels messages are given. And so on points num on point number two, that uh, Adventism was birthed out of reformation. When, when you look at uh, uh, the years 1830s, uh, the feast of the trumpets coming to the year 1840s and then 44, what was happening is that uh, Christendom had uh, been uh, uh, engrossed in the papal doctrines and uh, uh, people like uh, William Miller arose uh, after Martin Luther had arose in 1517 and preached reformation. Now William Miller arose to preach the truth, the midnight cry of that time, which was to call people out of this rubbish of the papacy. And this is how Adventism was birthed. The reason why Adventism was birthed is to, uh, uh, it was uh, chosen to be able to finish the nine pointers that are in the book of Daniel chapter nine. This is why the uh, Adventist church was uh, uh, brought into, into a timeline so that um, we may be able to uh, preach the message of the three angels and prepare people for judgment 
and then the people may be able to be prepared to dwell with the Lord. That is the second point, that we are a church which is under reformation, a church which is by beholding Christ, they are changing from glory to glory. Every now and then new truth or old truth are shining in a new way. Point number three, point number three, uh, it says that, um, Adventism presented the best opportunity of finishing this great controversy. Now, this is the reason why Seventh Day Adventist was raised, and uh, I have talked about this in some of the uh, presentations I've, I've, uh, I have presented. But uh, again, I, I like just to look at this point number three in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter nine, verses uh, twenty-five. If I'm not wrong, no, the book of uh, Daniel. Chapter 9, verses 24, sorry. Book of uh, Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24. Uh, if uh, you don't mind, this is what it says. That uh, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. One, to finish the transgression. And we are looking at the point number three, that our work is to finish the work. And so point number one is to finish the transgression. Point number two is to make an end of sins. And point number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Point number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. And point number five, to seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. These are the six pointers that uh, ancient Seventh-day Adventism were not able to do. But now the Lord raised up Seventh-day Adventist to be able to finish these six pointers that uh, the ancient uh, Adventism were not able to do. Now, to finish transgression is simply to bring amongst the people an end of sin, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. To make an end of sins is... Uh, to uh, uh, preach the gospel as uh, a witness to the whole world, to show the world that the remedy that you are giving unto them has done a work in you, and to make a reconciliation to you, uh, reconciliation for iniquity. That is, uh, as we go outside there, that is to preach the gospel uh, uh, that will bring healing both to the spirit and to the physical part of it. And this is part of the medical missionary work. I can't enter it this time. But reconciliation of iniquity is the gospel of uh, healing of the mind and healing of the physique. Then bringing in everlasting righteousness. And this is everlasting righteousness simply is the message of uh, justification by faith, where actually you believe that uh, the Lord will do what his word has said it will do. We talk about faith, but what is faith that belongs to the third angel's message? It is uh, uh, accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ and him taking away our sinfulness and uh, uh, giving us his own righteousness. This is uh, the impartation and the imputation of righteousness of Jesus Christ. Then to seal up the vision, to seal up the vision. This is the 2300 days prophecy and what it had to accomplish in the most holy place. And it is tied together with the anointing of the most holy. The anointing of the most holy, uh, people have had various uh, views on the anointing of uh, the most holy. And uh, whether you see it as the most holy place or you see it as Jesus Christ, the thing is the same. When atonement had been done on the day of atonement, the Shekinah glory came and filled the whole temple and enshrouded everyone that was there, including the high priest. So the anointing of the most holy place is like uh, making an end of sin going into the most holy place and making it clean once again. And the high priest being anointed or removing his uh, uh, the priestly clothes and having his kingly clothes or uh, uh, removing his linen clothes, uh, the clothes that he had done, uh, the atonement with and uh, putting on his uh, uh, linen garment. And uh, this was the anointing of the most uh, uh, holy that had to happen on the day of atonement. And so Adventism was a bath for this sole purpose 
of finishing uh, these points that um, we are talking about. That is, we are in acceptable period where actually darkness is covering the world. And if we have to come up, if we come up with the truth uh, of the Bible, then many will be brought into truth when darkness is reigning all over the world. Adventism was birthed out of reformation. Reformation has to continue until the end of the time. It did not stop with Luther. And Adventism presented the best opportunity of finishing the great controversy. Nine, 70 weeks was taken from the 2300 prophecy and given to the nation of Israel particularly so that they may be able to do what is written in Daniel chapter nine verse 24, but they failed. And now 1810, the years that were remaining on 2300 days, they are allocated to the Seventh day Adventist, the modern Adventist to accomplish what the ancient Adventism were not able to do. So the Lord himself actually promises a revival. The Lord is not slack in what he has promised to do. He says in Hosea chapter five, verse 15, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me early. So the Lord himself is willing to return. The Lord himself is willing to impart power on his people. But the problem has been the reception of Jesus Christ himself in his church. And that is why the churches are weakly and are ready to die. In Hosea chapter six, verses one and two, come and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he revive, he will, after two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. This is uh, some verses which are actually uh, having a lot of information of what the Lord is willing to do with us in a short period. He says that in two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. Meaning that the Lord is willing to do this work of reformation in a very short time. The problem has been the church arising to this call and uh, accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ that it may work in their lives and they may be able to cut the sh uh, short the work in uh, 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 to cut short the work of reformation. And so reformation did not end uh, with Luther as uh, many suppose, but it has to continue until the close of the time. And this is the work that we have to do, the work of uh, reformation. Uh, reading from uh, Review and Herald, June 1, 1886. Review and Herald. Review and Herald. <coughs> Review and Herald, June 1, 1886, paragraph 14. We are told Christ was a Protestant. He protested against the formal worship of the Jewish nation who rejected the counsel of God against themselves. He told them that they taught for doctrines the commandments of men and that they were pretenders and hypocrites. Like whited sepulchers, they were beautiful without, but within full of impurity and corruption. And this is the state that many of us can find themselves in if we are not walking with the Lord step by step. If we're not working with the Lord step by step, then we can find ourselves in such a condition. The reformers led back to Christ and the apostles. They came out and separated themselves from a religion of forms and ceremonies. Luther and his followers did not invent the reformed religion. They simply accepted it as presented by Christ and the apostles. The Bible is presented to us as a sufficient guide but the Pope and his workers remove it from the people as if it were a curse because it exposes their pretensions and rebukes their idolatry. May, maybe it is because we have been used to uh, a form of religion that uh, we have lost sight of Christ and the work that is for this time, men looking up to men to finish the reformation. But uh, Seventh Day Adventism is, uh, we are told is, uh, the name itself is a rebuke unto the world. It is a symbolic name. And as I said, that our work is to finish up the reformation. Uh, the name itself, it is a symbolic name. Talking about uh, our work and uh, our name being a symbolic name, uh, I'll share something that, uh, and I said, uh, I'm just reminding us of the things that uh, uh, we are already 
uh, knowing. Genesis chapter, uh, Genesis chapter one, verses uh, 31. Look at this. Genesis chapter one, our work as Seventh day Adventists. We are told that our name itself is a symbolic name. What does it mean our name is a symbolic name? Our name goes hand in hand with the work that we have to do. Genesis chapter one, verse 31. This is the creation week. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now talking about the creation, when God finished everything, he pronounced everything good. And then in chapter two, verses one, thus the heavens and the earth were finished during creation and all the host of them. And on the, <coughs> sorry, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And so the name Seventh Day Adventist is a symbolic name in that it shows that we have finished the work and the work is good. And so every day, every time we celebrate the Sabbath, every time we, we, we come into the Sabbath, we are proclaiming that the work is finished or the work will be finished in some way. And so we are not just to see it that we are Seventh Day Adventist, but everything has to end. And when it ends, it has to be good. In the work of recreation, when it was finished, God pronounced it was good. In the work of recreation, when the work is finished, the Lord has to actually say it is good. And this is what the Lord is waiting upon us to do. So our name is actually a symbolic name. If we never understood, Seventh Day Adventism is a, a symbolic name. And uh, the Lord wants us to realize who we are. Maybe what the church has suffered much uh, about is uh, uh, a loss of identity. When a people loses their identity, actually, they do not know why they were raised as a people. And so Seventh-day Adventist was raised to finish the work. Who is to finish the work then? We are the people that are to finish the work. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 61, Paragraph 1. The great and wonderful work of the last gospel message is to be carried on now as it has been before. Now as it has never be, been before, sorry. The world is to receive the light of truth through an evangelize, uh, evangelizing ministry. So there should be a ministry which its very core work is evangelizing the world. And how is it supposed to evangelize? It is through our books and our periodicals. Now, let me pause for a second here that uh, there should be a ministry that uh, has to finish up the work and it has to do the work more than it has never done before. When you look at what Luther did, when you look at what the reformer did, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Haas, Jerome, Zwingli, and uh, all these reformers named them. We are told that in the end time, we shall have a ministry which has to do a work more than what they had to do. And how are they supposed to do this work? They are supposed to do it through periodicals and their books. Now, brothers and sisters, let us uh, try to think about this. How much as a people have we accomplished and specifically gospel sounders rekindling reformation? In the last three years that we have been in service, how has our work been to finish the work? If uh, we examine ourselves and as we examine ourselves as a people, as members, as a people who are going out, out in the field, how much have we done to accomplish the work? How many books and periodicals have we printed to finish up the work? Maybe I can say that uh, when we are away on the sanctuary, we can be found wanting because much has not been accomplished and uh, you know the story, the rest of the story. And uh, uh, this we have to think about. And so much work than has ever been done before has to be done. And this is through books and periodicals. Our publications are to <clears throat> show that the end of all things is at hand. I am bidden to say to our publishing houses, lift up the standard, lift it up higher. Proclaim the third angel's message that it may be heard by all the world. Let it be seen that there are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. Let our literature give the message as a witness to all 
the world. And so our work, if there is a work that uh, as a people we have to be engaged in right now, is the work of scattering those periodicals, those books and uh, literature as autumn leaves, because they will do a work that uh, an evangelist cannot do, that a living voice can do. Periodicals have to go, literature has to go, and books have to go. And we ask ourselves, where is the money? We ask ourselves, how shall the work be accomplished? The work shall be accomplished by self-denial. This is the work that we have to do. Every child of God has to come to a point to finish the work. And uh, talking about the three angels' messages and finishing the work, our work, uh, we read this in uh, 4SP 199. This is a quote that has always challenged me. Uh, 4SP, page 199, paragraph uh, 2 and uh, paragraph 3. Slowly, Jesus sends his people a message of warning to prepare them for his coming. And uh, are we seeing Christ sending forth his message? Yes, we can see that. To the prophet John was made known the closing work in the great plan of man's redemption. He beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, that is Revelation chapter 14, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Now, who are this message entrusted to? The next paragraph tells us, the angel represented in prophecy as delivering this message symbolizes a class of faithful men. Brothers and sisters, are, are we faithful men who obedient to the promptings of God's spirit and the teachings of his word proclaim this warning to the inhabitants of the earth? This message was not to be committed to the religious leaders of the people. Now, if you ever thought that the message was entrusted to the leader of a gospel sounders or any other ministry, you are wrong. These messages were not entrusted to the leaders. And why? This message was not committed to the religious leaders of the people. They had failed to preserve their connection with God. And I pray that uh, the gospel sounders have not actually failed to preserve their connection with God and had refused the light from heaven. Therefore, they were not of a number described by the apostle Paul, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the brethren the children of light and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor darkness. Uh, the reason why actually the message was not entrusted to the leaders is because people had been taught to look at fellow human beings. And this retarded the whole work because if men could not make decisions and could not make a call, go there and go there or work in this line, then people could not work. And so the Lord takes the message from those who are professing leadership and gives it to common people so that the message may go forward with power. Drawing strength from Christ and not from human being, which are arms of flesh and can fail anytime. And so the third angel's message is to go forward and time is so short and uh, we must be organized to do a larger work and laborers are needed to who comprehend the greatness of the work and who will engage in it. We need not just to have men who think that uh, they are supposed to uh, define every minute point of how work should be done. But we need many men anxious by the power of the Holy Spirit, not trained in literary institutions, who can go forth with the power of Elias to do and accomplish the work. In fact, uh, we are told to pray to the Lord so that he may give us the latter rain in Zechariah chapter 10, verses one, to be able to finish the work. Now, the, the work of uh, uh, asking for the Holy Spirit, it's not left unto men, but uh, it is left, uh, it's not left unto the leaders to ask the Holy Spirit for the members to be empowered. Every individual can ask the Holy Spirit and be endowed with a gift to go up and finish up the work. We don't have to rely to any, uh, person to pray for us to receive the Holy Spirit. We can approach the Lord according to Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16, come and ask of this grace and the Holy Spirit in time of need. Then the Lord will send showers upon you and you shall be able to do the work. And so what is our work? 
we have a work which is important and part of the work is this, the call to enlist. If there is any time that we need to do a work of enlisting others into the service, this is the time. Christ is calling for volunteers to enlist under his standard. This is messages to the young people, page 24, paragraph three. Christ is calling for volunteers to enlist under his standard and bear the banner of the cross before the world. The church is languishing for the help of young men who will bear a courageous testimony, who will win their ardent zeal, stir up the sluggish energies of God's people, and so increase the power of the church in the world. Young men are wanted who will resist the tide of wildness and lift a voice warning against taking the first step in immorality and vice. So I challenge the young men who are engrossed in doing things that are actually not related to the third angel's message to wake up and be able to be enlisted to finish up the work because the work is so large, but the workers are few. But first, the young men who will serve God and give themselves to his work must cleanse the soul temple of all impurity. Now, when you look at the six pointers of Daniel chapter nine, verse 24, that is to bring an end to transgression, finish up the transgression, bring an end to sin, and then uh, bring reconciliation to iniquity, and then uh, uh, seal up the vision and anoint the most holy. This work cannot be done with the people who are still embracing sin and who are still uh, delighting in the things of this world. It needs a cut off from all things that um, will uh, 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 hinder you from working for the Lord. If there's a time that young men need to arise, this is the time. We are told uh, they need to purify their soul temple and enthrone Christ in the heart. Then they will be enabled to put energy into their Christian effort and will manifest enthusiastic zeal in persuading men to be reconciled to Christ. Will not our young men respond to the invitation of Christ and answer, here I am, send me. Young men, press to the front and identify yourself as laborers together with Christ, taking up the work where he, he left it to carry it on to it is completion. So young men, I'm asking, where are you? The young men are busy somewhere doing something, but that something is not everlasting. While we are not calling people to disconnect themselves from everything, we are calling people to disconnect themselves to the things that will hinder the spreading of the three angels. And if there is a time that young men have to arise and do the work, it is this time because the world is coming to an end. And what we are pursuing, we may find at the end of the day, as I started, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and then lose his soul? Young men, if Christ came today and asked you, what are you doing for the sake of the kingdom? What will you be able to answer? This is a challenge that I give to myself and the youth who are outside there, people who are 15, 17, 20, 30 years. When you look at the reformation, the people who did reformation were young people. Look at uh, E.G. White herself, she was 17. James White, not more than 21. You look like at people like Jane Andrews. In fact, the oldest person there was uh, 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 the captain of the host, uh, Joseph Bates. But the other people were young below the age of uh, 21 they were able to start the Seventh day Adventism and they are, today, by the way, you delight in calling those old men pioneers, but do you know that they were pioneers because they were young and started the ministry? They are not called pioneers because they are old in age, but because they brought forth the Seventh day Adventist message in 1844 at a very younger age. Now, if these men were able to go outside and do that work, and we are told that there is a greater work that has to be done, Old men cannot do the work. In fact, we are told that old men and little children will be laid to rest. And so the work remains to the younger people to arise and finish up the work. If we still depend on the older people, brothers and sisters, then we are misguided. We do not understand what our work is. And so young men, I want to uh, uh, urge you to rise. And so this youth must put on the whole arm of God, devote their time in self-examination, self seek the Lord honesty in prayer, study the scriptures and be acquainted with what it says so that uh, they may not be able just to meet the people who refute the gospel truth, but they may be able to show forth what the truth has done in their hearts. And uh, we are told that the young people 
are easier to bear the yoke while they are still young because there's nothing that hinders them. They don't have families, many of them. They don't have jobs even. And we are not saying that because you don't have a job, then you have to enlist in this work of uh, proclaiming the message because it will just be a substitute and not something that is coming from the heart. So young men and women, are you growing up to the full stature and the measure of the man Jesus Christ so that you may be able to present him when you are called upon? Or uh, do you see this work as a burden? An appeal should be made to the youth. And uh, parents need uh, to raise up their children in a way that when they are called to duty, they will not shun from responsibilities. The problem also has been in, uh, in the bringing up of our children, those who have children. You, you find that uh, parents have neglected to train up the children the way they should go, and when they are old, not to depart from the way. And this is a challenge because Adventism is dying. I have been visiting some churches and uh, holding some Bible studies with the youth and all this. And uh, brothers and sisters, it is somehow a shame that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist youths do not know. They don't have a clue completely about their history. They don't have anything that they know about Adventism. They are just Seventh-day Adventists because they found that their parents going to the church on, on, a, on a Sabbath day. But if you go into these minute things that will help us uh, say that we are Adventists. Our youths have no clue about that. And so this is uh, a call to the parents. This is a call to those people who are guardians of uh, young men. Please raise up these children, raise up this youth in a way that when they are called to be enlisted in the work of God, they will be able to respond to the call and do a work that has never been done before. A work has to be done, but um, uh, the field is so ripe, but where are the reapers? This is uh, the challenge. Who is to finish up the work? We are looking, exploring this question from every point that uh, our work, how to finish the work, a call to enlist, and who is to finish up the work? Uh, we are told in uh, Helpful Living, page 280, paragraph one, the trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ illustrate the position of the people of God in the experience before the second coming of Christ. So when you look at how the nation of Israel was behaving and how they responded to the gospel and how people did their own stuff, it illustrates what will happen prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what is this point that stands out the most? just prior to the first coming and prior to the second coming, it was God's will that the tidings of the Savior's coming should be given in the Scandinavian countries. And when the voices of his servants were silenced, he put spirit, his spirit upon the children and the work that the work might be accomplished. When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, attended by the rejoicing multitudes that with shouts of triumph and the waving of palm branches herald him as the son of David, the jealous Pharisees called upon him to silence them. But Jesus answered that all this was in fulfillment of prophecy. And if this should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. The people intimidated by the threats of the priests and rulers seized their joyful proclamation as they entered the gates of Jerusalem. But the children in the temple courts afterward took up the refrain and waving their branches of palm, they cried, Hosanna to the son of David, Matthew chapter 21, verses 8 to 16. When the Pharisees solely displeased, said unto him, Hear thou what this say. Jesus answered, Here have you never read out of the mouth of babes and suckling, thou hast perfected praise. As God wrote through children at the time of Christ's first advent, so he wrote through them in giving the message of his second advent. God's word must be fulfilled that the proclamation of Savior's coming should be given to all people, tongues, and nation. And so you find that uh, many of the olden people, many of uh, the leaders will never give this cry. But uh, the young people will do this. But for the young people to be do, doing this, they have to be trained up in a way that uh, they'll be able to accomplish the work without being afraid. 
So parents have a duty, as a ministry have a duty to enlist the young men. Our finances have to be spent and expended. Our resources, everything that we have that can be used to scatter the three angels message, we have to equip the youths with the right message, with the right spirit, and they be able to go and accomplish the work. And so our work is an important work at this time. And uh, if there is any year that we should dedicate ourselves in enlisting men and training men, this is the year. And uh, I'm urging all of us that uh, we may put out our resources, we may put out everything we have so that the youths may be enlisted to do the work. With such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained might furnish how soon the message of a crucified, risen and soon coming savior might be carried to the whole world. How soon might the end come? The end of suffering and sorrow and sin. How soon in place of a, a, a possession here with it is blight of sin and pain, our children might receive their inheritance where the righteousness shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Where the inheritance shall not say, I am sick and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard. And so this is the challenge to the youth who are listening to me. This is a challenge to the parents who are watching this and are listening to this. As the faithful tale one standard bearers are offering up their life for the truth's sake. As we see these old men who once rejoiced in truth and who once proclaimed it are being buried to the grave and resting to await the last trump so that they may come out of graves. Who will come forward to take their place? That is the question that I'm challenging the parents. I'm challenging the youths. I'm challenging my own family. Where are the youths who are to take up the positions of the old men who are dying, who once rejoiced in the truth and pro proclaimed it? Will our young men accept the holy trust at the hands of their fathers? Can we accept the button? Are they preparing to fill the vacancies made by the death of the faithful? Will the apostles charge be heeded, the call to duty be heard amidst the incitements to selfishness and ambition that allure the youth? While uh, young men, you are seeing many of your youth of your age um, running after the things of the world. How are you different from them? How are you writing your page in the history of eternity or in the history of heaven? Will you be numbered amongst those who shall run after the things of the world and then they lose their soul. Remember how I started, how shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Will the pursuance of the things of the world cut you off from doing the duty of God? Time is so short that we cannot lose it for a moment, young people. And the parents, the time is so short to be thinking about how your children will prosper in this present world while the eternity lies before us and we are anticipating to be it is occupied. We have an army of youth today who can do much if they are properly directed and encouraged. The, the youths around your village, the youths that we, you interact with, what do you spend your time telling them? We want our children to believe the truth. We want them to be blessed of God. We want them to act apart in well-organized plan for helping other youth. We do not just want our youth running up and down with the things of the world. Let all be so trained that they may rightly represent the truth. This is our work, giving the reason of the hope that is within them. But if we can bring young people, young men and young women into this world who can't give any reason for their faith, Brothers and sisters, we are failing then. We are not doing our duty. We need to have a young men and a young men, women having broader ideas and plans and using every opportunities, catching up the inspiration that comes from heaven so that uh, they may be able to use it for the kingdom of God. Every opportunity presented, they should use it for the proclamation of the three angels' messages. How much do you spend with them? And uh, when they come from the schools that they go, when they gather around the table, are we training them to finish the work or are we training them to be dwellers on the earth? And uh, messages to the young people, page 24, paragraph two. Look at this. Messages to the young people, page 24. 
paragraph two. You are to be men who will walk, walk humbly with God, who will stand before him in your God-given manhood, free from impurity, free from all condemnation, from the sensuality that is corrupting this age. You must be men who will despise all falsity and wickedness, who will dare to be true and brave, holding aloft the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Your talents will increase as you use them for the master, and they will be esteemed precious by him who has bought them with an infinite price. Do not sit down and neglect to do anything simply because you cannot do some great thing, but do whatever your hands find to do with thoroughness and energy. Uh, many of us will wish to have the gift of prophecy. Others will wish to have the gift of healing. Others will have to we, will uh, desire the gift of uh, speaking in tongues. But all these desires are good as far as they go. But the small talent, in quotes, what you call the small talent, what have you used it to do? Uh, as my part, I don't see I have uh, used my talent as it should be well to finish the work. The Lord has uh, given me the gift of uh, writing and uh, spreading uh, the pamphlets, uh, giving to the people to be able to supply them. But uh, as I look at myself, I see that uh, I haven't done so much through that talent. And uh, I'm praying that the Lord may give me strength so that uh, this year may not be wasted as other years have been wasted. And uh, with all these resources he has given to me personally, having everything that I need to be able to come up with those articles and print them out, what am I doing for God? As I aspire that I may have, uh, as I desire that I may have these gifts of the Holy Spirit, which people think they are so big, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, and all these gifts, this talent that the Lord has given to me to compile and print out the articles and let them spread in the four corners of the world, what have I done with it? I'm also challenging you, young people, with the talent the Lord has given you. Is it cookery that the Lord has given you? Is it... Uh, a son of consolation, like uh, uh, the, the apostle uh, Paul? And uh, is it uh, just uh, your talent, either seeing whichever talent the Lord has given unto you, have you maximally used it for the glory of the kingdom? Or are you waiting upon a, a higher gift, as you may think, so as you may glorify the Lord with? We must use every little thing that the Lord has given unto us to spread the message. Who has despised the days of small things? Haggai asked. While we may be sitting, you know, you remember the parable of the talents, whom God gave one, others he gave five, others he gave ten. You may be saying that, I wish God has given me five of them. I wish God had given me ten. But the one that you have is what matters. It's what God will judge you with. God does not judge people with the five which he has not given them. God does not judge people with the 10 which he has not given them. God judges the people according to the one that he has given to them. And that is no wonder he says that uh, if you do not use it, I'll come even take that which you have not. What does that mean that I'll take that which even you don't have? It means that this one you have been given, and you have slept on it, instead of God increasing something on it or giving something on top, he will take that which he has not even given you. So if you want God to take that which he has not given you, try to misuse that which you, are, you have. If you are a medical missionary, what are you doing in this world? Have you reached out to some people and uh, proclaim the message as it is in the Lord through your medical mission work. Uh, so uh, in the last segment, the Lord calls us to commitment as uh, I come to an end in a few short minutes that uh, the Lord is calling all of us to a commitment in this vineyard, our higher calling for commitment. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 15, and when the chief priest and scribes saw that the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. Progress of reform in Germany, a commitment to the people whom God has called to finish up the work. Remember, I'm talking about our work. This is 
using the talents we have, enlisting other people, spending and expanding ourselves, and raising up a generation that will finish up the work. Persons of all ranks was to be seen with the Bible in their hands. You and me, every person professing to be Seventh-day Adventist, have to be seen with Bible in their hands. Defending the doctrines of reformation. How many ministers can defend even what they believe? No wonder the message of the Lord says that, uh, uh, she says that uh, a time is coming when we shall be separated from our like brethren who think like us and speak like us. And everyone individually will have to face the tribunals and councils to defend what they believe. But when she looked at that uh, time, she saw how many people were confused with the ideas of what they believe. They were not able to defend what they believe because they had relied on their brethren. When they are with their brethren, they are so strong and vocal because they know they'll just call up a name amongst their brethren and that name will be able to answer their position. But let these men and women be left alone. Will they be able to defend the truth? And we are told that whoever is ashamed of God, whoever is ashamed of Jesus Christ, even Christ will be ashamed of him before God and the holy angels. What is it for you to be ashamed of Christ, not being able to honor the hope you have in Christ Jesus Christ? And so are we exercising ourselves? Somebody may say, oh, hold on a minute. The book of Matthew says, don't think of what you shall speak at that time because it is the spirit of your father which shall be speaking in you. But when you look at the same verse in the other synoptic gospels, it says that the Holy Spirit shall bring into remembrance. How can the Holy Spirit bring into remembrance that which you have not read, that which you have not exercised? So while it is the spirit of the father speaking in us in those councils, what it is doing is bringing into remembrance that which we have been learning. And so still we have a duty to do ourselves so that we may be able to defend the truth. It continues to say, the papist who had left the study of the scriptures to the priests and monks now called upon them to come forward and refute the new teachings. So the papist, they are calling the priests and the monks to defend the truth. But ignorant alike of the scriptures and of the power of God, priests and friars were totally defeated by those whom they had denounced as unlearned and heretical. Unhappily, said a Catholic writer, Luther has persuaded his followers to put no faith in any other oracle than the Holy Scriptures. Amen. And this is what you should be training our families, our household, the youth, and all members of the church to be doing never to listen to any man, but put faith in the word of God, which is able to be a shield, a defender, and a bulwark around all this confusion that is going around the world. Crowds will gather to hear the truth advocated by men of little education, and even discussed by them with learned and eloquent theologians. The shameful ignorance of these great men was made apparent as their arguments were made by the simple teachings of God's word. Laborers, soldiers, women, and even children were better acquainted with the Bible teachings than were the priests and learned doctors. Can this be said of us? That uh, we can stand before theologians, we can stand before the priests, the monks, the pastors, the presidents, and be able to say, here is the scripture, I have no other. Are we? enlisting ourselves for the work that is before us. Our work is greater than what we have ever anticipated because men of learned will stand to oppose our work. And so what is the work above all, all work? What is the work above all, all work? We read in uh, Messages to the Young People, page 227, paragraph two. The work above all work, the business above all other which should draw and engage the energies of the soul is the work of saving souls for whom Christ has died. Make this the main, the important work of your life. Make it your special life work. Cooperate with Christ in this grand and noble work and become home 
and foreign missionaries. Be ready and efficient to work at home or in far off clients for the saving of souls. Work the works of God and demonstrate your faith in your savior by toiling for others. All that young and old were thoroughly converted to God and will take up the duty that lies next to them and work as they have opportunity becoming laborers together with God. Are we ready to take up this work? Brothers and sisters. And so, uh, In uh, Testimonies, Volume 3, 381.4, those who feel no special pleasure in seeking to be a blessing to others in working even at a sacrifice to do them good cannot have the spirit of Christ or of heaven, for they have no union with the work of heavenly angels and cannot participate in the bliss that imparts elevated joy to them. Christ has said, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than ever, 90 and 90 uh, nine just person which need no repentance. So our work is to sacrifice for that one soul. In fact, we are told who can estimate the worth of the soul. We don't have to be indifferent if one sinner is in a problem. If one person is lost to heaven, that is something. The principle of the cross of Christ brings all who believe under heavy obligation to deny self to impart light to others and to give of their means to extend the light. If they are in connection with heaven, they will be engaged in the work in harmony with the angels. So angels are looking upon men and what they are doing and the sacrifices they are giving. But does God see anyone who is willing to sacrifice and spend everything for the sake of Christ? And so, Last two slides. What does the Lord tell us in closing? What is the Lord speaking to us? I close with these two slides. By personal labor, reach those around you. Become acquainted with them. Preaching will not do the work that needs to be done. And I want you to underline that. Preaching will not do the work that needs to be done. We can preach and we can have crusades, uh, I mean, gospel campaigns, we can have camp meetings and all this stuff. It cannot finish up the work. It cannot do what needs to be done. Angels of God attend you to the dwellings of those you visit. This work cannot be done by proxy. While preaching should go on, while camp meetings should be held, while online sessions should be going on, but the work of going door to door spreading the books, remember how we started? The books, literatures, our publication and periodicals are to do a work that has never been done before. So preaching will never do this. We have to go door to door spreading the message and angels will accompany us in those visits. Personal ministry. And we are being told that this work cannot be done by proxy. Money, land, or given will not accomplish it. Don't think that when you give tithe and offering, you are finishing the work. No, I'm sorry to say this is not finishing the work. You can retain your tithe and your offerings because tithe and offering is not to, going to finish the work. This work is not going to be done by proxy. It needs personal efforts. Someone will not do it. It doesn't matter what I'm doing right now on the screen. In fact, what I'm just doing is to arouse you from the sleep and arouse myself from the sleep that I have a work to do to spread those literature door to door. Sermons and preaching and campaigns will never do it. By visiting the people, talking, praying, sympathizing with them, you will win hearts. This is the highest mission and work that you can do. To do it, you will need resolute, persevering faith and wearing patience and a deep love for souls. 90. Page 41, the last of the slides, uh, second last. Everywhere there is a tendency to substitute the work of organization for individual effort. Now we say that uh, Gospel Sounders is organized to finish the work and people substitute that for an individual effort. No, we have Gospel Sounders as a ministry. We have other ministries, but uh, this organization does not finish the work in any way. 
it needs individual effort to finish up the work. Human wisdom tends to consolidation, to centralization, to the building up of great churches and institutions. Multitudes leave to institution and organization the work of benevolence. They excuse themselves from conduct with the world and their hearts grow cold. They become self-absorbed and an impressible love for God and man dies out of the soul. Christ commits to his followers an individual work, a work that cannot be done by proxy. Ministry to the sick and to the poor, the giving of the gospel to the lost is not to be left to committees or organized charities. Individual responsibility, individual effort, personal sacrifice is the requirement of the gospel. That is the challenge that I'm giving unto you lastly, the work which the disciples did, we also are to do. Every Christian is to be a missionary. True education is missionary training. In sympathy and compassion, we are to minister to those in need of help, seeking with unselfish earnestness to lighten the woes of suffering, of suffering humanity. Minister of Healing, page 104, paragraph two. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, when I look at this, I find that uh, we are so far behind the work that we should be doing of uh, having an uh, evangelizing ministry, which has to spread uh, our periodicals and which has to accomplish the work. And so this is the slide that uh, we have to think about so much as uh, we contemplate upon what I have been saying. 1961 paragraph one, the great and wonderful work of the last gospel message is to be carried on now as it has never been before. The world is to receive the light of truth through an evangelizing ministry of the word in our books and our periodicals. When liberty of conscience is threatened and the nation subverts the freedom of speech, this is the time our books and periodicals should speak. Our publications are to show that the end of all things is at hand. I am bidden to say to our publishing houses, lift up the standard, lift it up high. Proclaim the third angel's message that it may be heard by all the world. Let it be seen that here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so if you never listen to what I was saying, this is time to save a little coins. Buy if you can a print buy a computer and do a work that has never been done before. This is the time. We may not be able to meet in large crowds as we used and minister to people. Now, the Lord what he's doing is seeking a people who are observing the times that we are living in and understanding what to be done and do it. The little money that the Lord has given unto us if there is any other work that we can do is to pour money into publishing houses. There is no Adventist house that should be missing a publishing house. And if it has to miss a publishing house, then it doesn't have to miss a supply of materials to go to the fourth corner, four corners of the world. I'm giving myself the challenge. I'm giving you a challenge. What do you need? You don't need more than 30,000 to do this work. You need only a, a, a compute, 20,000 and a printer 10,000 and you'll be able to do this work. We invest in big things in our lives. We invest in very expensive things in our lives. We can go even for a loan of 200, 3,000, 300,000, 1 million money just to do something which is temporary. Why don't we go and invest in something that will help us finish the work. God bless you. And I hope that you will take up this challenge. You will pray for me as I pray for you that we may take up this challenge and finish up the work. An evangelizing ministry in books, periodicals and publication. This is our work. We have to finish up the work and we cannot finish it in sin. We have to finish it in righteousness. May the Lord be with you. And uh, where there's a way uh, where there's a will, there's a way. God looks at 
what we are desiring and he is able to give unto us. And so I pray that the Lord will hear your prayers and my prayers and be able to accomplish this thing because the prophecy has been given and it will be fulfilled. It's not a conditional prophecy that this ministry will be there in every Adventist home. Every Adventist must be a missionary and must go forth. This work cannot be done by proxy. And I thank the Lord that he will go, he's going to make it happen. Even if I don't get involved, even if you don't get involved, there are people who are going to do these things. Otherwise, the Lord bless you and uh, be able to accomplish his will in your life. Let us uh, uh, pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much. And thank you for your word, which doesn't lie. We have a work before us and it cannot be accomplished by proxy. So help us to take up the work individually and be able to accomplish it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much and uh, may the Lord bless you.